One of the first things you learn about when you start licensing your music are the different types of representation deals that exist. When you're wanting to license your music, you're going to need a rep. You're going to need a library or a publisher or a label or a licensing rep, uh, sometimes called licensing agents. Um, there are all, are all sorts of kinds of deals out there. Today, we're going to talk about one of the biggest dilemmas that you're going to be faced with, which is whether to go exclusive or non-exclusive. Let's dive in. If you want to get your music heard by music supervisors, if you're listening to this and you're an artist and you're just getting started or you've been doing it for a while and you're tired of pitching to a black hole and feeling like you're just not getting heard, I want you to head over to my website and download my free guide on how to get your music heard by music supervisors. It's completely free. I put this together to help you learn. There are five steps that I think you should follow. And if you follow each of these steps, one step at a time, I guarantee you will actually get heard and be in the top 1% that actually break through and get heard. Um, that's my gift to you. Thank you so much for listening. Today, I want to speak about exclusive versus non-exclusive representation. There are all sorts of reasons you should do one or the other. Uh, I'm going to give you my thoughts on it. I'm going to give you my opinion. I'm not saying that one is Absolutely, you, you never want to do this or you always want to do that. You have to take the knowledge that I share with you and decide what works for you. There are pros and cons to both. So let, let's just talk about when you're starting out as, a, as an artist and you get presented an offer, you get presented a contract by an agent or a manager. Managers are going to be exclusive. You don't want multiple managers managing you. That's, that's just odd and unusual. Um, and same with agents. If it's if you have a talent agent, let's say you're an actor, you have a talent agent, they're going to be exclusive deals. Um, when it comes to licensing, it's not always the case. With licensing, there are non-exclusive companies, there are exclusive companies, reps, libraries, uh, publishers, and their contracts vary depending on how they do business. And it's not to say that one way is right and one way is wrong. But there are certain things to understand about those deals. Let's start with the non-exclusive deals because I think that's where most people, when they're starting out, begin. That's where I started before I was doing licensing, before I knew the business of music licensing. I was an artist and I was pitching myself to be represented by companies. And the first deals that I did were non-exclusive because I didn't know what I was doing. I was dipping my toes in saying, yeah, I don't know. I want to be able to get out if I can. I, want, I don't want an exclusive deal. So I can understand and appreciate that perspective. Uh, and I want to tell you about those deals. The, the types of deals that I did were some of them were just non-exclusive loose license fee splits. There was another one that was a non-exclusive retitle deal, which we won't get too much into in this episode. I think there's a there's probably a whole episode that we could spend talking about retitling and what that means and how it works. Uh, I have a lot of experience with it, and I could definitely talk to that. So uh, I'm going to do another episode on that. But in this one, we'll just talk about that non-exclusive element. What it means is that when you sign the deal with, with a company to represent your music, non-exclusively, it means that other companies can also represent it non-exclusively. And if you can imagine that as a music supervisor, we're getting pitched a ton, a ton of music uh, every day, every single day by managers, artists, labels, publishers, licensing companies, both exclusive and non-exclusive, libraries, both, both exclusive and non-exclusive. And if you can imagine getting pitched the same material from multiple libraries, it gets a little bit dicey from my perspective as a supervisor, as a buyer. If I get the same song from multiple people, how do I know where to go if I want to license it? And some people just work off, well, whoever pitched it to me first, I'll go to them. And that's, I think that's a good policy to have. But what happens is you forgot maybe that that other person who pitched it second for this time, they sent it to you two years ago. And then that person reaches out and says, hey, why, why didn't you license it for me? And it, it's kind of um, a situation that music supervisors don't want to be in. In fact, when, I, when I'm on the other side of it and I'm pitching to supervisors, if that ever happens and I pitch something and I know it's not exclusive with my deal with the artist and someone else pitched it and that other person got the placement, I don't make a thing of it. I just let it go. It's not worth the uh, giving the supervisor the headache. 
and it's part of the, the territory that comes with having non-exclusive deals. So that's one reason I think that, that I lean towards exclusive deals for you and for your music. It's not the best position to put yourself in to have a, a bunch of people shopping that one song of yours with you know 20 different companies. It's just not great. Uh, so it leads to confusion in the marketplace. That would be one of my main things. Um, the benefit of it, non-exclusive, obviously, is that it's not a long-term commitment. You're not tied up to someone if they can't deliver. If something happens or doesn't happen and they can't deliver, you're you're stuck in a contract if it's if it's exclusive and there's no termination clause. So I think that that actually has to weigh into your decision too. If there's a termination clause, you know, is it two years, one year, three years, ten years, fifteen, twenty, perpetuity? All that has to weigh into your decision. And, you know, you, you have to take that into consideration when evaluating your potential partner because this individual or this company that you're partnering with, that's what they are. They're, they're getting a percentage. They're taking a piece of your IP, whether it's not exclusively or exclusively, they're getting a commission. And you have to evaluate, does this make sense to me? All, taking in, into account all of the elements that they're offering, the termination clause, how long the contract's for, what their commission is, is it exclusive, is it non-exclusive? You have to evaluate each and every one of those and try not to get overwhelmed when presented with a contract. Uh, and if anyone ever rushes you to sign a contract and you need more time, you're in control. Don't let them strong arm you into signing something. Take your time with it and read through everything. Make sure you understand it. Obviously, you should consult with an attorney before you sign any of your uh, property away and uh, but definitely you want to make sure that you read it thoroughly and understand it yourself if there's something you don't understand that you need to learn do some research hire an attorney uh, do a consult with me you can come to my website and license your music.com you can schedule a 60 minute consult and I'm happy to talk with you about a contract or whatever questions you may have uh, we can use that time together for whatever you want so uh, you could play me songs, we could review a contract, whatever you'd like. That's, that's something I just started offering recently. So um, yeah, non-exclusive deals. Uh, the other con, it kind of tied to tying to that first one of confusion in the marketplace is that there's several people shopping your music, several companies shopping your music. Now that can be looked at as a pro also. It can be looked at as something that works in your favor, having multiple people shopping your music you think there's more likely a chance of getting place and that it's kind of true and it kind of isn't uh in a sense yes multiple people are pitching to various projects and they're probably not all pitching to the same projects so you get wider exposure that way for your music but because of the reason i said earlier where multiple people are pitching the same song it works against you too because the supervisor doesn't want to deal with it they'd rather deal with exclusive companies so i I can tell you by from being a supervisor, I prefer to deal with exclusive companies that I know I can only get this from uh, Jennifer and I can only get this from Steve and you know I can only get this from Universal Music or this from Sony Music or wherever I'm going. I know that they have exclusive rights to that music. I'm not going to find it anywhere else. There's no chance of marketplace confusion. That's just not going to be an issue for me. So. Uh, it's definitely something that I take into consideration when I'm supervising, and it's probably the biggest reason I recommend going exclusive. That doesn't mean I would rush into it. I, I think that um, I would not rush into an exclusive deal. I would take your time and evaluate before you do that, but uh, definitely something I recommend. Now that said, I think that you need to understand something that that um, a perspective that most producers, most creators take with their music is that we're very precious about what we create. Rightfully so. It comes from our uh, creative intellect. We just created it. And you kind of, you get precious about it and you think, wow, this is an amazing song. This is an amazing record. Uh, I shouldn't let this go. And there's something to be said for being cautious and careful about where you put it. But being too precious about something can lead to that piece that you're being precious about not getting a fair chance in the market. I've seen people sit on songs and records for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and nothing's happening with it because they're just too precious about it. And part of the business is you have to be willing to share that with others, that if you're not going to do the work yourself, 
if you're not going to go to all the meetings, if you're not going to take people out for, for meals and spend 15 years building relationships uh, the way that us licensing reps have, if you're not going to spend the time to do that, you need to be willing to part with some of your, um, your income that comes from that record and that song. You have to be able to share that with others and not be too precious about it and know, know deep down that if you created something once, you can do it again. And I think that's really important to, uh, to reiterate. Once you've created something that came from you, you can then do that again. So if you let it go to somebody and it's tied up, don't focus on, don't focus your energy on, man, what's happening with that? What's happening with that? Let me follow up with them. Let me hound them. What, that, that's not a great place to focus your energy. Focus your energy on creating more just like it and create more. If you focus your creative energy on creation and just trying to level up and one up yourself every single time, you will find more success because you'll be able to give that to another person or another party or someone who's getting successful placements for you. You can then give them another one and another one, or you can then place it yourself. And the more you level up, the more you level up your creation, the more people are going to find you. Music supervisors are going to find you because we don't always go to representation companies. Sometimes we're just scouring the internet. We're scouring blogs and Bandcamp and SoundCloud and websites and just Google. <laughs> so uh, Reverb Nation, um, you know, there's companies like Broad Jam and Music X-Ray and uh, there's all sorts of companies that if you Google music and a genre name, you get a bunch of links. And as supervisors, you just dive in sometimes creatively. If you don't want to reach out to companies, if you want to work fast and find something on your own, sometimes it's fun to, to do that and put that puzzle, puzzle together. So, okay, I'm a little off point. Let's get back on point. Non-exclusive versus uh, exclusive representation. With non-exclusive representation, we talked about the cons being that it creates confusion in the marketplace and it's difficult to track placements. When you're a non-exclusive rep, it's hard to track your placements because multiple people are pitching that song. Uh, the, the biggest pro is that multiple companies are shopping you, so you're gonna have, um, you're gonna have more pitches and you know there's that old saying with sports that the more times you shoot, the more of a chance it's gonna go in the basket or it's gonna go in the net. Uh, yeah, that's kind of true with the non-exclusive thing. But if you have a good exclusive rep, rep, they're going to be putting up your music for all sorts of projects and the right ones that fit you. Because exclusive reps also, when you have an exclusive deal, there's more of an investment from them uh, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. They're tied to that piece of music because they know that they're the only ones that have it. So they get excited about it, right? Just like you're excited about it. When you sign non-exclusively with someone, it's kind of like saying, yeah, we're, we can date, but I'm going to see other people. We can date, but I'm going to see other people. It's not really a commitment from either side. When you go exclusive, it says, I'm committed to you. And the other person says, well, good, because I'm committed to you. Let's do this together. Let's work together to get things happening for your music. And a good exclusive company, a good exclusive rep will be able to do that for you. And exclusive publishers, exclusive libraries, that's that's all tied to that. Speaking of that, I want to talk about something else. In a lot of the music books that you read when you're starting out, there's a big, big thing that you hear, especially in the, the general books about the record business. And they say you should never, ever, ever give up your publishing. There's a caveat to that. When it comes to the traditional record business and you're trying to get artist cuts and you're trying to get you know songs cut by popular artists and that's really the traditional business it's not licensing licensing is a, a sub genre of the business and it's just becoming more and more popular because of how much success you can have with it and how much income you can create with sync and with licensing but um, that comment about you should never ever ever give up your publishing I believe it to be rooted in that traditional record business uh, you know, when you're trying to find a, a major publisher to sign you, or even an indie publisher, a, a Cobalt, a BMG, a Sony, a uh, Warner Chapel, uh, Downtown Music, Because Music, there's all kinds of publishers out there looking for writers. If you're trying to find that kind of deal and get an advance, which they, they are few and far between these days, then yeah, it makes sense. You don't want to give up your publishing before that because you need to have that 
to offer to these big companies once they give you an advance to be a staff songwriter with them. Uh, but when it comes to licensing and libraries and production music, it's very different because half the job is creating the music. Half the job is writing the song and producing it. The other half of the job is actually exploiting it and monetizing it. Uh, it takes just as much, if not more, energy and work to build those relationships and nurture them and get those licenses and start making that money and know the market and negotiate those deals and administer those rights and collect the monies and chase down the funds and, and distribute the funds. And there's so much to being a, a publisher, which is what a music library is or a publisher. And that's what you want a publisher to do for you. So you have to be a little flexible. I recommend being flexible on that. Uh, don't be too precious about your publishing. This goes back to if you created it once, you can create it again. When you create it once, you can create it again. So it, it, with music licensing, you're going to have people or companies, I, I say people, but really it's companies that are asking for publishing or 50%. Some companies might do 25%. I don't think 20% exists anymore if you're out there. I think that's crazy. I don't know how you survive. Um, you know, I, I've always believed that 50-50 split down the middle, whether you're co-writing with someone or co-producing or you're partnering with a company that's taking commission, non-exclusive or exclusive, 50-50 is fair. It's split down the middle. It, you know, you're doing half the work. I did half the work to create it. You're doing half the work to try to secure it and license it. Let's split it down the middle. That, that seems, has always seemed fair to me. Uh, you may disagree, and that's fine. This is just my opinion, but that's that. So when it comes to your publishing, it's a little different because you, you're, you're giving up uh, a piece of your copyright. And depending on the term of that pub deal, it could be for X amount of time. It could be in perpetuity. And libraries and production companies uh, or, or in the production music space, libraries in the production music space that are exclusive are going to take full publishing. There might be some that do co-publishing 50-50, but they're still going to take 50% of the license fees. And that's standard for libraries and production com production music uh, libraries. And most of those deals are going to be exclusive. So in that space, it's that's the standards. It's, it's exclusive. They take 50-50 and that's what it is. And you have to be willing to give up your publishing and even the control of your master to these production music libraries to do what they do because that's the way they, they have to run their business. Uh, it's a worldwide business that they, they are a part of. And I won't go too much into that, but it's all tied to you know being exclusive. Those deals are exclusive. When I first looked into trying to expand internationally and I reached out to uh, what's who's now my German sub-publisher, uh, Sanotan Music, when I reached out to them years and years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, they were interested. They liked the music I had, but they said it's not exclusive, so we can't we can't do anything with it. And it took me a while to come around to okay. Instead of trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, I need to you know adapt the way I do business. And I changed to doing exclusive deals. And now I'm doing business with them, and they're my German sub publisher. So uh, that's part of the business of the production music space is being willing to do these exclusive deals worldwide in perpetuity. And it is, it is what it is, and it's 50-50. So exclusive uh, deals, in my opinion, are the way to go. And I'm going to close with this thought. Just because you go exclusive with a company does not mean you cannot pitch your own music. You can still take meetings with people. You can still pitch those records and those songs. Uh, you can email people and say, hey, check this song out. Are you interested? And you wait when someone's interested. You say, great, I'm so happy to hear that. Let me introduce you to my publisher or let me hand this off to so-and-so. They're going to negotiate the deal for me. Uh, you know, you pitched it to that person. So obviously you want to facilitate and help make it happen. But you can still pitch it. It doesn't mean that once you assign the rights to someone, non-exclusive or exclusive, don't just throw your hands up and let them do the work. There is no reason to do that. You still should be out there working your own material. There's no reason not to do it. Nobody is going to believe in your music. No one's going to shop it the way you are. 
That's just the truth. It's the way it is, especially companies that have multiple artists to manage and multiple labels to manage and catalogs. The amount of attention you're going to get compared to the amount of attention you're going to give yourself in your own narcissistic way is just unrivaled. So uh, you got to do uh, what you do and pitch yourself even when you sign an exclusive or non-exclusive deal. It does not matter. Thanks so much for listening. Stay cool. Peace.